In this installment, we're looking at my favorite framing through the whole of the first episode of Sex Education. This is multifaceted, what's going on here. There's just layers of stuff. Now, I've previously said that I don't really want to get into the framing so much, but I don't feel there's really any way of avoiding what is going on in terms of the way they're positioning the camera and then in terms of what they're doing within that frame. So the staging of everything and what it means and the things that it might represent. Now you can get in a twist just thinking about what any aspect of the set dressing or the cinematography or the acting or anything means but there are definitely things here that we can look at in a bit more detail and perhaps glean a bit of the uh, vibe that the director was trying to bring to this piece because of it. Immediately here we see a contrast between the last scene where we have Otis and his mother having a bit of a heart-to-heart -heart sitting very close to each other. Here we are calling back to that really symmetrical frame that we saw before in the classroom but now everyone is positioned in their own zone so let's break this down a little bit. We have this zone just here for Adam, I finally remembered his name, this is the Groff family and this is Adam Groff, the school bully. But he may be in his own zone off to the side, he's not a bad chap though because he has a pet dog and he seems to care for him so that's that's something right. This is part of an arc with him where we're seeing perhaps some redemption coming through and the idea that he is not a completely lost cause. The fact that he has affection for this animal goes a little bit to that. He is not completely heartless. And we're about to see he's not necessarily the most uh, menacing character within his house. He has light coming in down this side. And if you look at the shadows that are going on down here, you can see quite clearly it's sort of toppy, sidey, light. Yeah, it's casting out that way on the dog. And I suppose it's catching the dog as well down there, which makes me think the light's kind of somewhere on the other side of the wall, just up here, beaming in, something like that. Doing most of the lighting in that area with it. There's a practical up here, which we'll just call out. And then we've got all kinds of stuff going on, like there's a bit of light coming from something. They've stuck a light up in that um, sort of semi half mezzanine landing place and we just got a single chair up there which is sort of a bizarre little set dressing note and in fact zooming out for a second the set dressing here is crazy this is such a 70s or early 80s style house i mean you've got the carpet you've got this this door this door handle look at that door handle who knew someone with a door handle like that way back in the day? It's just all over the place. The, the little serving hatch just here, the clock. I'm sure my great grandmother had a clock just like that. The framed little fan thing. All of the little notes of the curtains, the sort of um, valancy wooden bit just there, the sliding doors that are going on. It is screaming a different era. So we've got uh, Adam over to this side and then over this side, we have everyone else. We have the biggest frame belonging to his father, the head teacher, Mr. Groff. And then within that frame is his mother. So his mother is very much belonging to his father in this. So he's off by himself. He's got the smallest bit. He's squeezed to the side. He's very much on the periphery. His father is in this big bit of frame just here with his mother in and his mother's in the background readying everything for dinner and there's definitely a case for saying that this is as well as being an interesting frame a frame which represents the dynamic within the family so what else do we have well we've got a picture frame just here so that picture frame is actually of his father and his father's dressed in military outfit with some um, awards and that's the frame that we can see. That, that is the only picture. There are some other things going on down here, which maybe are other family pictures and stuff, but I can't really tell. But that's the one that's prominent. And something that we can talk about with the lighting here, let's talk about a bit of lighting, we have a lampshade. And that lampshade is playing on the wall. We have light coming down here. 
and that is actually doing an awful lot. It's casting that shadow, it's lighting up the whole area with the picture frame and stuff. But at the top, not so much. We don't have really any light spilling out of the top just here. And that's something which we're going to see a lot throughout uh, the interior night scenes. And it's something which, if you look at film and TV, you'll often see that uh, lamps cast light out below, but they don't cast it out so much above. And that's because people, when they're setting these up, they don't necessarily want the light flying everywhere. So you just cap it off. And that can be done in a couple of different ways. You've always got to be careful to make it safe, so you don't want to set something on fire. Uh, less of a concern these days where we have LED bulbs. Uh, if we were using tungsten for this, then you wouldn't want to put things directly on the tungsten bulb because it can melt. I remember I had a, I had an A-Team um, figurine. Uh, which one was it? It was Murdoch. I had Murdoch. And when I was a kid, I don't know, I must have been four or five, I must have left it on top of a lamp and I burned his arm. He, his arm kind of melted because it was a tungsten bulb. So that got really, really hot. So what they do is they just cap that off. Uh, you can use black wrap foil, or in this case, it feels like maybe it's just a heavier graded diffusion because there's something coming up from that, but not all that much at all. You can just see it sort of on the picture frame there. And we've got a similar story on this side as well. We have uh, the light casting out down here, lighting that whole area, but above there is nothing really leaking out. And obviously the lampshades are gonna cast a different amount of light depending on what they're made of, and they're going to change the color temperature of the light and all the rest of it. But they are actually playing on the scene and that's important. This one here is super bright, as is this one just here. So they're playing all over the wall and this is motivating any of the light that's on Mr. Groff just here. So apart from the frame and the obvious 70s decor, we've got a little bit of light for Adam and then quite a lot of light on this side as well to layer everything up. Moving on to the next frame, we're reversing and we see that the light is now coming in sort of from this angle just here. It's slightly toppy and slightly sidey. So because he has now a downside, I feel like that can't possibly be the chandelier. And indeed, we're talking about this in terms of it being lit. So it wouldn't be the chandelier that they would have bought something in to do this. But the motivation is now slightly off to that side where the chandelier was more in the center. So he would be a little bit more flat lit if that was the case. In the back, this is a bit weird. We have this whole area just here, which is lit up. And that's about the only thing that I don't think I can find a justification for in regards to this being like a 70s set. Because in the 70s or the 80s, and it isn't set during that time period, I appreciate, but that's the vibe we've got going on. You don't really have lights that could do that. Maybe you have um, fluorescent tubes, but having fluorescent tubes in the um, curtain rail area of your window would be an extravagance. I, I, I don't see it being a thing that would be done. Nowadays with LEDs, no problem, stick an LED strip up there. And that's probably what that is, either sort of like an LED ribbon or possibly um, some LED tubes. You could do it with Kina Flows as well, of course. And that is also happening on this side just here. That's casting down and just giving a little bit of light. It adds interest and it helps us to focus on Mr. Groff in the center. And now we see Adam is entering his frame. Now Adam is illuminated from uh, this side just here with a little bit of something which would be motivated by that um, lamp that we saw before. We had the lamp on the table and we had the uh, light fixture on the wall. If we're thinking in 360 degrees and flipping around to where he would be, that's the motivation for it. Not that we see it in this shot, but it wouldn't be that. It, it just wouldn't be that for this. It doesn't look anything like that would look, I don't think. So he has a downside here. He's catching fairly soft light from that direction. So something has been bounced into the wall or a soft box or some kind of diffusion frame is just kicking on him as he comes in. So he is very much being enclosed now within his father's frame and he is small in the frame in his back and his father is sitting down. I'm getting more into the philosophy. I'm just gonna have a sip. I recommend the Flare Espresso machine. It is awesome in lockdown. It allows me to have a wonderful, delicious coffee and I've got a little Bellman steamer as well so I can actually have like a Cortado or a Macchiato or even a flat white if I want. Genuinely good espresso. Mm. 
Yes. And it's the choice of a new generation. Getting more into the philosophy of what we're seeing just here, a seated character is usually portrayed as holding all of the power. And this doesn't just fit within the realm of film and TV. If you think about um, politics, there were several examples of um, Tony Blair and I think it was George Bush at the time, where Tony Blair's talking to George Bush and Bush is sitting down, Tony Blair's standing up, and the papers had a great time just sort of pouring over this and talking about how Bush had the power and Tony Blair was just sort of coming and talking to him. And I don't know, you think about it, uh, in films as well, like The Godfather, he's sat down there, he's got power. Um, subverted a little bit in True Romance, um, Drexel is sitting down and Clarence comes in and he's standing up. So he doesn't have the power. He's in a more powerful posture, he's ready. But the other person is so relaxed, they're just there, they're just in control. There's no question that anyone else can do anything to them. I feel like there's a bit of that going on just here. Adam is small in the frame, he is bigger in the frame, and he's sitting down. Call out to the mug. I'm going to see this again. It's got the dog on. Everyone loves the dog. No one loves Adam. It's just a subtle thing of like that the, the dog is more important than his child. So apart from that, I don't really think I want to call anything else out just here. We do have a modern TV actually in the background. That is a flat panel TV. In fact, the only bit of modern tech that we see outside of phones within this. Next frame. I think this is my favorite frame throughout this whole sequence. There's so much to call out. I'm just going to geek for a minute on the, the retro that is going on here. So check it out. Look at the cups. Look at the tea towel. Look at how she's dressed. She's dressed in just shades of ready brown. It's just all at, look at this. Look at this sort of kettle water heater thing. Look at that tray. I, I sure my grandmother had that tray. I, I'm absolutely positive we had that tray. Got this tabletop just here with all that uh, vinyl sort of over it. You know, you know this, you, you've seen this before. Of course, we do have the dog again in a little picture frame just here. Yay, dog, most important thing. Pops of color, we've got a little bit yellow, got a little purple. Not much color in this, so it is worth calling out when it happens. And these curtains, my goodness. I recognize those curtains. I know that people had curtains like that when I was growing up. And especially in kitchens, actually, bizarrely, that is such, such a accurate portrayal of that. And then in the back here, we've got this mixer, such a retro looking mixer and the tiles. And it's a really faithful recreation of um, that, that aesthetic. This door handle again, look at that door handle. So what do I call out in terms of lighting here? Well, she's obviously being hit by something. We've got uh, this going on. So it is directional, is a little bit uh, toppy. And I would say that uh, actually that light is coming from somewhere up here, obviously on the other side of the wall. And you could do this uh, kind of like I'm being lit now. I've got all kinds of madness going on behind me, but I've got a 60 by 60 softbox up there. So if we were in this scenario and we just stuck that right up in the corner, edged her in with that, maybe put a grid on it. Although I'm going to say no to the grid actually, because where we have uh, all of this stuff down here, we actually do see there are shadows being cast out this way from everything that she's placing down just there. So I feel like that wouldn't necessarily catch so much if she had a grid, if she had a grid on the light, but it's doing a good job on her. We've obviously got a nice key side and then she has a reasonably, oh goodness me. And then she has a reasonably down fill side, down for the context of what we're doing just here. And what else do we have? Well, the whole space has got a base level of illumination and that base feels a little bit cooler and a little bit more green, just a tiny bit perhaps than she is. She's got nice, rich skin tones. So that actually is a flattering light on her. How would I do that? There are a couple of ways that you could approach this. So for a start, you can see that over this side, we do have a little bit of uh, shadow coming across, which means that whatever is creating the illumination throughout the space is probably up in the sort of center of the room just here. 
because we're also catching a little bit, tiny bit on her hair just there, you can see that something is playing on her and her shoulder. Yeah. So I think that if I was doing this, there would be three or four ways that I would approach it, depending on what equipment I had at my disposal. I reckon that if we're looking at this in terms of a modern setup, this would be a light mat. So you'd have a light mat throughout this entire area. Could be, could be as big as you want, I suppose, as big as you can rig up there. And that's just creating a base level across the whole room. It's lightweight, it's easy to put there, it's soft, and you can see from the shadows, we're not getting really any shadows to speak of, apart from like right down in the corners here where we're really deep behind things. But apart from that, it's pretty flat throughout the rest of the shot. Of course, we do have a little bit of something coming in here, but really barely anything worth mentioning. So a light map would be good because it's very easy to rig it. Uh, you could probably get away with um, doing it with some kind of wall spreader. For those of you that don't know, like a wall spreader is, and I'll cut in some shots, I've got some DIY wall spreaders here, like Acropops, what you use to put up um, plaster wall on a ceiling or something and hold it in place. Uh, you can do this. I don't recommend doing it if you're not confident with it. If you're doing this on a set, then you'd have gaffers and crew to, to recommend what would be best for the location that you're in because it's not always appropriate to use a wall spreader and you want something that's gonna be secure and you want something that's gonna be able to hold the load that um, you need for your lighting. So it's not easy just to jump in, especially when you've got talent underneath it. But a wall spreader, yeah, just um, would go there and you'd have another one like over here and then you have a bar in between. It's got like a screw and basically you just unscrew it and it pushes out. There are various different flavors of them. The simplest just receives a bit of wood and then you have uh, the screw at one end with uh, another kind of fastening, uh, modern make them. So you can just then push out to the sides and then you can mount whatever you want on them. There are so many benefits to using a wall spreader. If, if you've got the crew to do it um, and the experience to do it, it keeps your set clear of stands, which is great because it means you can keep reframing and you don't have to move stands around. It means that the light can be consistent throughout so you're not changing things in terms of where the light's positioned. And then on top of all of that, you have the ability, if you're doing a shot that requires it, to go complete 360, and you're not gonna see any stands or any grip or anything else because it is completely contained up in the ceiling. Uh, the obvious downside is that there is a certain amount of uh, crew that's required to do this, and you have to be careful when you put them up. You might damage surfaces, you might go straight through like a um, plasterboard wall if you screwed it too tight. And equally, if you load it too much, you're gonna drop it down on your talent and that is not cool. So it is something which can be used in the right circumstances. If you go in that route, you can take anything else up there as well. So that could be Kino tubes, um, that could be quasars. If you were doing Kinos or quasars, I feel like for this, you'd have some diffusion over the top of them as well. So at that point, yeah, if you can go with a light mat, it is a more self-contained option for this. What else could you do? Well, if you weren't going the route of having that uh, wall spreader, then you could actually take, let's see, a um, boom arm, menace arm, something like that. So that would be positioned over here. And then you you could mount your um, light mat onto that. You could mount your kinos onto that if you wanted to. Or you could go with something like a um, paper lantern, jemble, something like that. It would give you light across the whole space. It would kick it out everywhere. You could, and with those, you can put a skirt around one side if you want, so you can take one side out of the equation. However you want to use it, it's possible. If you weren't doing a jemble, you could do a pancake. A pancake would be good because you could take it um, up closer to the ceiling because it's flat. And then you can skirt it off as well if you want. So you have that uh, nice soft top light just over the whole space, that would achieve a very similar look. So let's go one more. Um, if you didn't have access to a wall spreader, couldn't do a wall spreader for your location, and you didn't have a boom or a menace arm capable of doing what you needed it to, or maybe you can't fit it into the location, then the easiest way of getting around this is probably just to get a light out of shot somewhere here, and uh, it would have to be a very focused light, so at the very least, you're talking about something with a Fresnel lens that you can focus in, and that would just um, blast up into the ceiling 
whenever you're doing this, you've got to be really careful not to kick the light everywhere. So you need to flag it, you need to use your barn doors, shoot it into the ceiling, ceiling becomes your soft light and that just bounces down. The benefit of that is that it doesn't require any rigging above you, it keeps everything um, off to the side. So it can be a very graceful way of approaching this with the minimal amount of fuss, minimal amount of crew. Downside for that is that it can be very difficult to, on a wide shot, hide the thing because you can't really have it down here because it's going to catch on the table, it's going to catch edges there. You can't have it down at the back here, um, it would be very difficult. And the only way you could potentially get around it is if you had a light fixture with a projector lens, um, some kind of ellipsoidal, ellipsoidal lens that you can focus. So that way, if you were able to, you could use the cutters on it, um, little uh, leaves kind of that just slide in on either side, and you can then create just a patch of light and it doesn't spill anywhere else. It's a very, very focused beam. If you're able to do that and you had access to the kit, then that would allow you to do this without so many flags and it could get you out of a tight spot. I can't say for certain which way they've done this. The only other thing that I would like to draw attention to here is that when you're lighting someone, like we're talking about lighting her with a fixture up here, if she moves, she's gonna fall out of the light really fast. The fall off between here and here is going to be pretty dramatic for her because the light to start with can't be more than four or five feet away at most. It works perfectly well. You can definitely cheat it. Indeed, it's working for me right now. But as soon as you have talent that are moving around the space, there's no reason that uh, that light should be falling off. We don't see any fixtures in this whole set for her. So there's no motivation for her being close to a light source or anything like that where you can sort of justify in your mind if someone leans in close to a lamp, it's going to be brighter on their face. We don't get that just here. So she's kind of set on her mark and if she moves over the other side, she's going to move out of her light. There's not many ways that you can completely cheat this with smaller fixtures. Using multiple fixtures and dotting them along here could maybe get you out of it, but it would be a bit of a fudge to make it work. The only way that you can get around it completely is by using a bigger fixture further back, but you can't do that within this scenario. It just, there's nowhere to go really. What I have done in the past where I've had to do something really fast and the talent had to move and we had to keep the light on them the same was get someone to Hollywood, a couple of Astera tubes and just walk along, keeping a consistent distance from them so that they kept that light on the side of their faces. Here, Maybe you could do it. I mean, if, if you had to, if you absolutely had to make this work, you could potentially have something on a slider. I would really want to grid it down if I was doing that. This is a bizarre scenario, but you could have the light on a slider, grid it down, and then you could have it um, tracking cross, so maybe four foot as she moves this way. You might start to catch things in the background if you were doing that, but you might get lucky if it's gridded and you had it pretty well controlled, and it's mostly playing on her because it's quite close to her and the level falls off dramatically after that, then you'd be able to cheat it that way. That's the most bizarre solution to a very, very simple lighting setup that I can think of, but there it is. So this was my favorite sequence in this first episode. Next time we are going to look through, next time we're gonna look through this uh, whole science lab scene. It's mostly daylit, and there are a couple of things which I think we can draw from it, especially for people who are doing commercial filmmaking, if you're doing work with schools, if you're doing work with medical companies, engineering companies, even offices, you can have similar settings where you have windows down one side, you've got some overhead lighting, and then you've got desks or spaces where people are. So it's something which you might be able to take something from as well.